Thank you. As you know, I'm Damien Esposito. Today I'm here to present my research project of trying to attach a porphyrin to a carbon nanotube by a covalent bond to hope in, hopefully make a photovoltaic cell that would mimic pho photosynthesis. So to begin, give you a little brief outline. I go into a little history of, uh, of fullerenes, carbon nanotubes, how we make them, what they're good for, porphyrins, uh, photosynthesis, dive into the literature procedure I based my research off of, my research plan, the results I got, hopefully future goals I have, let's see where the research will be taken, uh, give some thanks, and then I'll open up the floor to some comments. So we'll begin. Or we won't begin. 1985, uh, at the time there were two known allotropes of carbon, diamond and graphite. At the time, there was a gentleman, Harry Croto, working for Sussex University, who was examining interstellar space using microwave spectroscopy. Basically, he was looking at red giant stars uh, to find polyalkynes, uh, hopefully long chains of them. Uh, he had heard of a group of Richard Smalley and Robert Curl working at Rice University. They had devised a AP2 apparatus, which was a blasting laser that took a piece of medium and blast uh, you know, fragments apart and threw that into a mass spec so that they could get a mass spectrum. Uh, so ideally what he was looking for was is to convince them to go ahead and blast a piece of graphite and get up a spectrum so that he could compare it to what he was looking for in the red giant stars. So he contacted them and it took a little convincing. They weren't very receptive to actually blasting a piece of graphite, but luckily for them, they went ahead and discovered two now, an, a new allotrope of carbon. Uh, seen here. Uh, the mass spectrum that they, they did get out of the, the AP2 apparatus showed two peaks, one at C60 and one C, for C70 molecules uh, that they nicknamed Tonto and the Lone Ranger. <laughs> but one thing that they had a problem with was is coming up with what the exact structure was. They, they didn't understand what it was that they were looking at. So he uh, Harry had talked to the mathematicians at Sussex and said, can you work on mathematically trying to figure out what was going on? So in turn, uh, he was playing with his daughter one day, uh, creating little domes out of p uh, plastic uh, p pieces of paper, hexagons and pentagons. And it came to him that possibly these structures were actually balls made up of hexagons and pentagons with, with carbon atoms. So he go, went ahead and recontacted the math department and said, hey, why don't you try incorporating that into your model and see what they can come up with? And they actually found that these C60, basically like a soccer ball here, and then like a rugby ball here, the C70 molecules, actually what, what they had found. So they had a problem, though. They're like, how did this form? You know, you blast apart and you're getting a ball out of a piece of graphite. So what they figured was, was going on was they, as they blasted the graphite apart, uh, they were dangling bonds at the edges of the graphite that forced the material to curl up on itself, creating like a ball structure. Uh, so what they did was, is at the time, there was a famous architect, Richard Buckminster Fuller, that was creating geodesic domes. So they nicknamed the molecule the Buckminster Fullerene, or the Buckyball after him. But to really analyze the, the structure, they needed to make a lot more material than that blasting laser could produce. So they went ahead and came up with this bell jar design. Basically, they took two carbon graphite electrodes, placed it in a vacuum, and zapped a 200-amp, 20-volt current across it and created a soot. From that soot, they went ahead and used sublimation and extraction with benzene to separate the C60 and C70 molecules from the soot. They later then took the C60s and C70s and used column chromatography to separate the two out. From that material, Harry was actually able to get the first carbon-13 NMR of, of a buckyball. At the same time, probably a little before, uh, there was a Wolfgang Krochmer and Donald Huffman who had actually synthesized a buckyball as well. They came up with and got the X-ray pattern, UV vis, and IR spectrums of the actual buckyballs. Uh, but it would be uh, Croto, Smalley, and Curl that got the Nobel Prize in 1996 in chemistry for the discovery of the buckyballs. So we go six years later, there's a Dr. Sumo, Sumio Ayajima working at the NEC Corporation who was working on a modified procedure of making buckyballs. And what he had discovered was a bucky tube, which is basically a carbon nanotube, 
with two, two caps, one at each end, basically of a half buckyball. So what that led to is, is a discovery of, well, look, we have a bucky tube, so that must mean we have a single wall carbon nanotube. And then they also discovered multi-walled carbon nanotubes where they have nested layers anywhere from two to 25 layers deep. But that's all well and fine. So we know we have carbon nanotubes. So what, what are they? So what happens is as they are grown, they're one of three classifications they fall into, zigzag, armchair, and chiral nanotubes. Uh, they're determined, and I'll show you on the next slide, that their chiral vector with the index d dictates what properties that they have. Basically what happens is, is, as we learn in inorganic chemistry, every atom and molecule has a valence and conductance band. And it is the gap between these that dictate its properties. If there are no gap between these two, so there's no gap, or an overlap is shown here, it acts like a metal, allowing a free-falling electron to go from the valence to the conductance band. That's why metals are shiny and why they conduct electricity. If there is a small enough gap in between the thermal excitation, raising the temperature of the material up, it'll allow an electron to bridge that gap, making it a semiconductor. If the gap between them is too large, that regardless of however how much temperature or energy you add to it, there's no way for the electron to get there, the material acts as an insulator. In this way, armchair tubes act as metals and are, uh, have metal metallic properties, while zigzag and chiral tubes are, act like semiconductors. So how do we figure that out? So basically what we do is, is we all have a carbon nanotube. We cut it down the side, fold it out like a piece of paper, and lay that down. Right? So the two lengths of the carbon nanotube now become the axis, as I've shown on the slide here in blue. So somewhere along one of the axis, a carbon atom will intersect that axis. We'll label that point A. Across the width of the nanotube, we'll, we'll draw a line cutting the hexagons exactly in half. We'll call that the armchair line. Slightly above, or above the armchair line, somewhere along the opposite axis, we will find another carbon atom, and we'll label that one point B. The chiral vector then becomes the, the vector from point A to point B. What happens is, is if this degrees here, the degrees between the armchair line and the chiral vector are zero such that the line lays on the armchair line, it's an armchair nanotube. If it's 30 degrees in between the armchair line and the chiral vector, it's classified as a zigzag nanotube. And if it's anything in between, it's just chiral. But what further, what we can do then is, is take these other two vectors here, a sub one and a sub two, and basically from point A, count every second carbon. So one, two, one, two, one, two, and each one of these carbons that we jump to increases the index for n. We do the same thing from point A, going downwards every second carbon, and, every, and we count for each one of them one, two, three. Now the sums of vectors a sub one and a sub two make the chiral vector, and it's how we determine if they're metallic or semiconducting as well. So what you can say is, is if n minus m is divisible by three, it's a metallic nanotube. If it is not, it's, it's semiconducting. So what you can say here is, is like a, a nanotube with an index of three zero or six zero or seven one, all of which you know six minus one is divisible. Six minus zero is divisible by three. Seven minus one is divisible by three. They're all metallic. So all of the bolded numbers here are metallic ones. The one I used in my experiment, unfortunately, were six five, so semiconducting. But how do we make them? So here I've illustrated five separate ways that we can make carbon nanotubes. We have the arc discharge method, which is actually the one that uh, Croto had designed in Iajima and actually later went and modified. We have laser ablation, chemical vapor deposition, the high pressure carbon monoxide process, and the one that my carbon nanotubes were made of, the Como cat process, which uses a cobalt molybdenum uh, uh, catalyst in a fluid bed to vaporize a hydrocarbon gas, and then the gas, the gas then grows uh, carbon nanotubes on the actual catalyst. So why to use metallic single wall carbon nanotubes? The idea here is, is that I want to conduct electricity very well, or electrons, I should say. So multi-walled tubes are actually not ideal for this situation. Uh, because they have nested layers, their conductance of each, each layer interferes with one another, so it's not uniform. 
Some other uh, reasons that we would use a metallic semiconducting uh, carbon nanotube is, is because they're incredibly strong. They're 117 times stronger than steel. Uh, they have high thermal conductivity, and they're highly elastic, which means you can apply a force both compressing and pulling on the tube, and it'll return to its shape once that force is removed. Also, they're ideal for bridging the microscopic and macros microscopic and macroscopic worlds with a one nanometer diameter and a length that reaches in the millimeter up to one, one half meter length. You can use it both to connect, you know, both say circuitry and uh, molecular items. Here are some applications to go over. Uh, just uh, radar absorbing materials, conductive adhesives and, and coatings. They're being looked at for batteries and fuel cells, uh, advanced computer chips for their high thermal conductivity, body vehicle armor and textiles. And even though I'm trying to use it for a photovoltaic cell, one of the most important things I think they should be looked at for are biomedical applications. Because if they're made up of carbon and we're made up of carbon, I feel that there's something they could do with that. And their ability to functionalize carbon sidewalls could lead them to vascular stents, neuron, gro neuron growth, and regeneration. So this leads me into porphyrins, what I'm trying to attach to the carbon nanotube. Porphyrins are large ring-like structures. They have four, sub four pyrrole subunits, all connected by methane bridges. And it's at these bridges, the 5, 10, 15, and 20 positions, that can have a number of substituents. And it's those substituents, along with the possible, possible metallated center, that gives the functionality of the porphyrin. Uh, some examples of that are uh, an oxygen transporter that we've seen right here in heme. Uh, there uses catalysts for enzymes. Uh, photosynthesis uses it, uh, in at least two different chlorophylls to absorb solar energy. And then it gives pigments their pretty colors. Photosynthesis. This is really what I'm trying to mimic right here, right? So a plant takes solar energy, it com comes in, absorbs in carbon dioxide and some water, changes it into an energy storage of glucose, and then releases oxygen in the global carbon cycle. It uses chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B here, uh, two different structures, uh, along with other pigments like beta carotene to make the process work. So it's this idea of using a porphyrin as a solar energy harvesting antenna and attaching it to a carbon nanotube that I'm really trying to mimic here. So ideally, this research, th all this research led me to find this procedure that I wanted to try and base my research off of. It took a multi-walled carbon nanotube, put it in an acidic solution, uh, concentrated acidic solution of uh, nitric and sulfuric acids, and sonicated it for about six hours. Uh, sonication is a process of agitating a solution uh, with sound waves. Ideally here, you want to break apart the carbon nanotube and create defect sites that allow the acids to attack and create carboxylic acid groups. The second step then takes those carboxylic acid groups with thionyl chloride, turns them to uh, acid chlorides, which allow, and here, I'll call this porphyrin here, the tetrakis 4-amino phenylporphyrin. I'll just refer to that as TAP from now on. But it allows the four amino groups coming off of it to create an amide bond. So here's my research plan. Uh, my first phase was duplicate the research. I'm not using a carbon, uh, multi-walled carbon nanotube, but I'm using a single walled. Uh, duplicate it, make sure it works. The second step was is to create this porphyrin, uh, the 5,4 aminophenyl 10, 15, 20, tris, 4, and N dimethyl aminophenyl porphyrin. Uh, my idea was is that the groups on the ends here, the three of the four of them, uh, would all be electron donating groups. So my idea was is that it would allow the porphyrin hopefully to release an electron easier than the previous porphyrin had. Uh, I still do have an amine group here, and that's what I would try to attach the porphyrin to the nanotube with. Uh, once that was successful and I proved that I was able to attach the porphyrin to the nanotube, uh, I basically wanted to then try and attach my porphyrin and tap to the same nanotube. Uh, photosynthesis uses two different, uh, two different uh, porphyrins. To, to collect and harvest the energy. So I'm figuring that if nature can do it with such high efficiency, then we should be trying to do something similar. Uh, if that was successful and I was able to attach two of them at the same time, then it was my idea to take the carbon nanotube, anchor it to a piece of titanium oxide glass, and somehow try and create a photovoltaic cell. So 
this is what I tried to do. Uh, I took some single wall carbon nanotubes, threw it in an acid solution, sonicated it for six hours. Dr. Selzer says, this could take a long time. So set it up overnight, let it run, I'm going to come in the morning, check it. So I set up the, the apparatus, put the, porf the, put the uh, solution with the nanotubes in it, and it didn't work. Uh, filtering took about 10 seconds, so I kind of figured something had happened, something was wrong. Uh, he came in the next day, I talked to him, I said, this was a lot faster than you said, you lied. So he turns around, <laughs> he turns around, and uh, so we decided to actually start testing the filter in the acid solution, and we realized it dissolved. So the research that I had used actually indicated a different filter than they must have used. <clears throat> so I went ahead and uh, we, we went ahead, talked to Dr. Greco and Dr. Baluha, kind of brainstormed a little bit, asked them for ideas on, on how we could filter this. Uh, they actually gave me two different ideas, uh, Teflon filters and then the little Teflon uh, cartridges that I would have to force the solution through. Uh, deciding that the filter cartridge was a little bit of a pain in the ass, uh, I went ahead and just used a Teflon filter. <clears throat> Use the same apparatus, so I took another set of carbon nanotubes, put it in the acid, sonicated it for six hours, and when I went to go filter it, it wouldn't filter. I sat there next to the apparatus, the filtering apparatus there, for two hours. Not a single drop came through. It all sat on top of the filter. So I'm like, all right, this, this, is, this is messed up. What's going on? So I called Fen Menomex, who is the manufacturer of the filter, after checking their website to make sure that their filter is supposed to work with the acid. And I said, what's going on? And they're like, oh, you need to treat the filter first. I'm like, okay, sure. So I went ahead, treated the filter with methanol, got some more nanotubes, put it in some acid, sonicated it for another six hours, and I actually started to filter. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to get something. And I got something but I got nanopaper. Like, all of the nanotubes had congealed together and just formed masses. And I'm like, all right, those, those aren't nanotubes. I can't, I can't do anything with this. What, what's going on? So I went back to Dr. Selzer, and he's like, well, why don't you just take some nanotubes, sonicate it in some water, try filtering it again, see what happens. So we did that. I did it in about, you know, half the time for three hours, collected it. I got nanotubes. I'm like, all right, so something's working here. So I went and took an IR, which I'll show you guys later, and decided, all right, this seems to work. Let me try this again. So I took some more nanotubes, took some acid, sonicated it for another six hours, and I got a different problem. They all embedded themselves into the Teflon filter. Not a single one of them would come out. Tried it in an oven overnight, tried shaking it, tried scraping it. They, they weren't coming out. So I'm like, all right, this is, this is really getting annoying here. I, I can't filter. I'm graduating this year. I can't filter. I can't get past step one. What is going on here? So luckily, whether, whether Dr. Selzer contacted her or she contacted him, uh, there was a Dr. Lenore Kuby, who actually works for the National uh, Renewable Energy Research Lab in uh, Golden, Colorado. And uh, he's like, I have her email address. Do you want to talk to her? I'm like, please, I need this. And so I talked to her, and, and she talked me off a ledge. I'm like, I'm freaking out nothing's working, what the hell's going on? And she's like, first off, nanotubes, nothing you ever want to do works. It's horrible. It's just research that's never going to work. So she's like, first off, you need to ditch the filtering idea. It doesn't work. One of two things happen. Either they get embedded into the filter, check, or they all glom, glom together, check. So at least I succeeded in failing. <laughs> so later on, she's like, you really need to think about centrifuging. She's like, do you have one at school? I said, well, I think we do. So I talked to Dr. Prieto, and uh, she showed me how to use the centrifuge, and Dr. Greco went and told me how to actually, you know, decant and pipette and all that. But basically what it is is you, you, you take a tube, put acid and nanotubes in it, and spinning in a contraption, spin it really fast so that all the nanotubes are, you know, pushed to one side. And then you can pipette off the solution and collect the solid on the bottom. So I went ahead, got some nanotubes in an acid for six hours. I centrifuged it 11 different times. And finally, once the solution I got out was relatively neutral, I collected my nanotubes. And I was actually able to get to step two. So I took those tubes, ran an IR, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, then I took them in a 
dried, uh, flame dried apparatus, I reflux them with some thionyl chloride to turn it from the carboxylic acid into the acid chloride. Uh, after 17 hours of refluxing that, I took that and in a long day, uh, through the grace of Dr. Greco and his manifold apparatus, I flame dried another reflux where I put my porphyrin and, or the tap porphyrin and my car, hopefully my acid chloride single walled nanotubes in and reflux that for 64 hours under a nitrogen atmosphere. So I'm thinking, ooh, maybe I actually got somewhere. So from the water sonicated pure nanotubes, I got my IR, which you're like, what is that? That's, that's a line. That, doesn't, that has nothing. But again, we're not, it's, we're not expecting anything, right? Because it's, it's net change in a dipole moment, and there's nothing we should be seeing. So, all right, that's good. I got my carbo carboxylic acid functionalized nanotubes. And right here is a peak at 1709. And you're like, that's not a carbonyl peak, right? I mean, carbonyl peak should be somewhere down around here. But the literature, which I'll show you shortly, does actually indicate that this peak at 1709 is a carboxylic acid group, or at least a carbonyl of a carboxylic acid group. Now, keep in mind, right, carbon nanotubes are, could be very long in length, and having one carboxylic acid group attached to that might not actually show up very much. But we never rely on one piece of characterization data to prove that you did or did not do something. So I went ahead and got my porphyrin attached to the tube, and I took another IR. And unfortunately, I have no idea if I actually got anything. Because when I compare it to the actual literature value, it doesn't match up. The numbers don't look right, and I'm like, I should be seeing an amine peak somewhere around here, and, and this, this just doesn't look right. So I was a little dejected. You know, here's an example of just to show you what happens at each step along the way. And I was happy with this one, right, because I got my 1709, but this, to me, didn't really show anything. Now, this is the literature uh, IR that they had come up with. And as you'll see here, yes, they are actually calling this peak at 1709 a carbonyl peak. Now, again, I compare this to my, my hybrid and their hybrid, and I am missing this big peak at 3438. So I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm a little upset. What's going on? So I said, let me take a UV vis. So I took my porphyrin, put it in some DMF, and I got this nice big, sorry, band here at 436, uh, representing the transition from the ground state to the second uh, singlet excited state. And then we see some Q bands here, you know, representing the, sing the ground state to the, s the first singlet excited state. I'm like, all right, so that, that looked normal. That, co that was comparative. And then this little red line here is actually my porphyrin attached to my nanotube. And you'll see here that the sorry band shifted from what was 436 to 430. I'm like, all right. So I look at the literature. I'm like, all right. So the scale is not exactly up, up to the same. But they, they, they uh, reported a 436 to 429 shift. I'm like, OK, that's, that's OK. That, that actually is within reason, right? One nanometer uh, error range from, from what they've reported. So I like to believe that I actually was able to attach my porphyrin to the nanotube which is great. The only problem is that's what I got to. Uh, unfortunately, it, it took me so long with the filtering issue uh, to, to get that resolved that I was only able to get to phase one of my research. Uh, so where I would like to see this taken was is to build the porphyrin, maybe not the one I had indicated in this slide. After taking instrumental with Dr. Yen, I realized if I want to really shift uh, the absorb absorption band, uh, I'm probably going to have to add a lot more conjugation to the ring, maybe even attach a couple of rings to the same one just to, to shift it. But either way, once I'm able to actually build a porphyrin, I want to attach that to the nanotube, prove that I did that, and then again, go back to the, let's get two, two of them on there at the same time. So hopefully if that is actually ever accomplished, they can attach that to a titanium oxide glass and then actually see if they have a solar cell. So I want to thank Dr. Selzer for uh, allowing me to work in his research group, uh, for letting me switch my majors and come back to chemistry three and a half years ago, uh, giving me a two-hour talk. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Lenore Kuby, who's obviously not here, but she was instrumental in my research. Um, I would not have gotten anywhere if it was not for her. I, I, I cannot thank her enough. 
uh, Dr. Prieto, Greg Ellen Baluha, you all each had an important part in helping me along the way. Uh, whether it was just ideas and filtering or, or the centrifuge, or it just, it really helped. Uh, Dr. Robertson's in, in Secundo, you, you let me talk to you about things I found or ideas to bounce off you. Thank you. Uh, I really needed that. Dr. Malinelli for ordering me up everything I ever needed and giving me a hard time. Uh, the rest of the faculty and the entire chemistry staff, thank you. Um, I came back to school. You, you helped me get back to where I needed to be and, and to make me feel like I went back for the right reason. Like it, it just, I, I felt lost at one point and I'm glad I came back here. And Jeff, you, yeah, you. Um, thank you for bothering me. Thank you for coming and finding me whatever, wherever I was and just bothering the hell out of me. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the four guys I studied with for Orgo, uh, Jeff, Danny, Jay, Spencer. Um, I wouldn't have gotten it through, gotten through it without you guys. Um, it was tough. Uh, Nathan, who unfortunately isn't here, but I feel like I kind of took him under my wing a little bit. Uh, he was he was part of my dynamic. Uh, Erica, Julio, Alex, and Sandra, thank you. Um, you made school fun. You made it worthwhile coming here and and getting through it. It was tough. It was hard. Um, I felt like I lived here. Seeing you here with me made me feel like what I was doing was right. And and I thank you all for that. And references. And I want to open the floor to any comments, questions, or concerns you may have. <laughs>